Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Fred Oliveira. I'm here to talk about uh, some of my uh, open stack experiences and uh, some of the uh, uh, what we've done and uh, kind of what we look to do with uh, Verizon. Um, and I want to you know, thank Fred Hatch for sponsoring this. And, um, I'll just have a, a few slides here and then we can um, we're open to uh, questions. And, uh, Feel free to try to in the middle of the yeah, kind of find the rather kind of best spot here. Um, um, this is just Verizon, uh, the obligatory slide. Who we are, we're large. <laughs> uh, me, um, statements engineer, a um, few things I was a part of a small startup of Podswitch and uh, fired uh, three years ago. Um, and before that, various uh, startup companies and uh, various large companies in that. Uh, mostly been working in virtualization, system software, and storage. Um, so, what's our problem? Um, you know, there's typically our biggest problem is that we are um, network growth is going faster than um, uh, we can monetize it. Uh, the costs are still pretty high, uh, and we can't um, get revenue to rise as quickly as cost uh, Return on investments networks are still very expensive, and we're deploying more and more high-speed, long-haul networks. Uh, all of those are very expensive to install and uh, monetize. Uh, but we're trying to uh, come up with another solution for how do we make that work. Uh, and then, kind of our existing problems, and this is probably a carrier problem, and I'm not sure how many of you are aware of the uh, carrier issues. Um, but we tend to buy things uh, in vertical silos, and uh, we have lots of um, single vendor uh, installations of a lot of the network equipment, uh, a lot of the environment. And we're trying to get out of the mode of having a, uh, a stack of equipment. Uh, that serves a particular single purpose that can't be reused, uh, isn't easily expandable, isn't incrementally expandable. Uh, and so one of the solutions we're getting after is, um, what, how do we go after this? And one of the, so this is our current problem, is that there is tons of equipment, uh, of all single usage, single uh, equipment, single um, service, uh, and we'd like to add, Turn this into a virtualized function. Uh, so there's a uh, group that's a startup at, uh, under Etsy uh, to uh, add um, virtualization to this environment uh, and see if that will uh, enable the uh, separation of some of the hardware uh, environments and uh, enable software functions to run on that uh, a, a more um, uh, common. Um, less single purpose uh, environment. And on top of that, uh, in fact, probably the largest gain of a is some of automation. Uh, all of our installation um, today is kind of in single purpose, uh, single uh, in I manual innovation. The, uh, there's these uh, operation manuals that are large that uh, all of our operating staff follow to, for any particular problem. We need to get somewhat out of that role, enable automation, trust automation. I think that's actually from an organizational problem is the trust aspect of the organization environment. Uh, how do we make that work? Um, benefits of the operators, I just build here. Um, so again, common hardware platforms, it's part of our goal is to reduce the special purpose uh, purpose-built hardware environments. Uh, if you look inside these frames or equipment, it turns out they're often uh, our common hardware built by uh, lots of other common hardware vendors, uh, server vendors, uh, but they're built in a specific configuration for uh, a special purpose. Uh, and we like to have a, a more of a general purpose environment that we can leverage different uh, software components on top of that. Um, again, classic, uh, faster time market and Risks. Uh, we, our in average deployment time uh, is six to nine months. Um, we like to reduce that 
uh, an order of magnitude that we can uh, to have a new service. And along with that deployment risk comes along uh, business risk, because, uh, because of the deployment time, it takes a long time. Uh, we can't really deploy a new service very cheaply. Uh, limits our ability to uh, try new services in this environment, because just because of our process involved. Uh, and then if something is deployed uh, and we actually made a mistake, uh, we have uh, dead equipment that's sitting there that actually is just consuming electricity, making heat. Um, and so we need to get out of this mode that we can reuse equipment, reuse the environment, uh, leverage automation to make this deployment uh, work better, uh, easier, and uh, faster. Uh, this graceful software upgrades is kind of an interesting uh, environment. Uh, Today, to do a uh, software upgrade, uh, you basically, in our environment, need to have a complete separate system uh, on which to do the upgrade. Uh, and then, uh, once that's proven to work, then you can unwind the existing system. Uh, so there's a very large task of uh, deployment. Well, we'd like to get the mode of uh, basically in incremental add uh, of equipment, um, slowly migrate uh, perhaps live migrate some of the operations from one set of equipment to another set of equipment uh, and um, do this without having any service interruption. Uh, again, service interruption is probably our biggest uh, environment, our biggest problem that we're trying to address. Um, whenever a cell tower or anything goes down, this is the first thing we get a call from is uh, that something has failed. Uh, any network failure is uh, Bad thing for us. And this is where the, the classic carrier grade five nines and above uh, level of operation that we try to run. Um, when that came up, that apologies. Um, so there's an organization, uh, European, I don't know what it's stands for, but all the time, it's European um, uh, standards organization. But they uh, have started an effort called NFP, uh, Network Function Virtualization. Uh, and there's the goal is basically to put a standard model together uh, where a, um, uh, application developers can develop the, uh, their application independently uh, and deploy that on a common set of hardware uh, and put all the um, uh, interface points, uh, common interface of, of environments, uh, common uh, control paths, uh, so that people can have uh, a unified environment and develop their application once, uh, and develop the standard interfaces or uh, element management systems. Uh, they're classically today done on a single hardware basis or a single application basis. Um, that they're the standard interface to this uh, um, manager environment. Uh, so again, develop these things once, uh, run it on many different environments. Um, how does OpenStack come in? Uh, so I think one of the things that's um, become apparent uh, both in the uh, NFP community and uh, outside in um, the application developers uh, is that it, it's become a de facto uh, implementation uh, and the common deployment environment for uh, the existing vendors to port their applications uh, into this environment. And there's a lot of deployment happening uh, in this environment, uh, a lot of different um, uh, applications and a lot of different infrastructure environments. Um, so there are people specifically targeting um, uh, whole sets of infrastructure, uh, specific hardware uh, environments, uh, specific uh, orchestration, and uh, actually specific limitations of OpenStack, which I'll talk a little bit about. So my task, um, uh, my goal was to architect the common platform. Uh, and this is uh, uh, encompassing um, both the uh, hardware aspects of this uh, environment, uh, to be uh, hardware, be hardware agnostic, um, but kind of network focused. Uh, we have to design all, sorry, most of our traffic is north-south that we're addressing the internet or our uh, internal network. Uh, so we don't have, actually have a, a large majority of the traffic going between VMs inside our environment. There is 
a bit in uh, what we call service chains and uh, we're going from one environment to the next, but a lot of the traffic ends up going in and out of the uh, internet or into our network. Um, and then operational service. This is, again, probably our biggest environment. How do we get five nines or six nines behavior out of uh, an environment that is probably hardware capable, three, four nines, uh, software capable, right now, probably two or three nines. Um, how do we make that reliable? Uh, and kind of some of the process we're going after is uh, trying to, uh, within the community, OpenStack and um, you know, some of our uh, partners at Red Hat and others, uh, to make an environment uh, and push upstream uh, functionality that would make this environment more reliable. Um, some of the things that, uh, because carriers are not the largest part of the community in the OpenStack, we end up uh, not having necessarily the largest voice in the community. Uh, so some of the capabilities that we're looking for in the environment uh, aren't getting addressed necessarily in the OpenStack environment. So we'd like to somehow push that up more as much as possible. And so that's again, leveraging some of our you know, community environments. Um, the self, oops. This is uh, self-service, and this is a typical thing. Uh, today, we have all these um, single silo stack uh, from hardware to uh, our system environment to um, the actual application itself. Uh, is typically managed uh, top to bottom by a, a single operational staff. Um, We'd like to break that into a, uh, a horizontal environment that there's a, uh, a platform environment that can address multiple of these applications uh, and have a, uh, an operation staff that's knowledgeable about uh, the operation, the hardware, and the virtualization environment. And I actually want to step back. It doesn't actually need necessarily be completely virtualized. And in fact, I guess it has just Previously, a lot of the functionality is automation and orchestration of the environment. So there may be hardware components in this that need to be orchestrated. Uh, and in fact, we may do um, uh, bare metal provisioning of some of the operations, some of the um, uh, virtualized functions, which are not virtualized in that sense, uh, onto this environment. But security, I mean, certainly security and isolation uh, are very important for us. Uh, like once you do this, uh, how do you provide non-interference between um, multiple internal customers, which is kind of multiple people running applications in this environment. How do you separate the resource allocation and um, can you do resource rather reservation uh, on this environment? Uh, talk a little bit later. We, a lot of the, um, this one from here. So this is my environment. Uh, so I actually have a couple of some environments I don't know if people have seen. Uh, this is one rack of my equipment. Um, but part of my task is basically a lot of evaluation. Uh, I've been talking to, uh, I guess, just about all the uh, suppliers in this environment. Um, and what I've built up in this environment, this is one rack of equipment. Uh, and this is interesting because it's a uh, these are all QSFB uh, copper wires, this is 40 gigabit uh, uh, connections. This is uh, um, kind of my high speed uh, path to test all the uh, environments. But uh, as you can tell, it's not uh, professionally wired. This is all my wiring, uh, which is you know, all the tangled wires today. Um, but as part of this environment, I have tested uh, uh, lots of variations of this. Um, I currently have six open stack environments uh, running in this uh, environment. Uh, and these are uh, from basically uh, four or five simultaneous uh, proof of concepts in this uh, lab. And that's kind of my ongoing process uh, for now and for have been for the last year and well, I'm going for probably the next year and a half. Um, but from this, this allows me to test a lot of different configurations. So, okay. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, I actually have a little bit of description here. Um, but multiple, the, in this environment, uh, are all direct 
cache storage. So this is SAS and SATA drives in the front of these uh, storage servers. So uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about what different uh, tests I've done in this part. Um, but so shared directed patch storage is probably the best answer to that. Um, uh, so these are all the things that I've been, companies and areas that I've talked to uh, over the last uh, year, year or so. Um, and tested out the various uh, <coughs> capabilities of these things. Uh, part of our um, environment is if you start, you know, get a random piece of hardware, how do you initially provision it, uh, initially load it with uh, operating system? There's Chef Puppet, uh, certainly all the uh, uh, environments available from Marantis, Canonical, Red Hat all have uh, provisioning environments. Um, and uh, I've dealt with all of them. Uh, they're all incomplete, I'll say, at this point, but they're at maturing pretty well. Uh, so there's stuff that's coming along pretty well, but uh, there is still a place to go. Uh, and so the storage environment, so most of what uh, my path has been um, using Ceph Cluster and LVM. So these are all uh, environments of uh, locally shared um, drives that are sent out over a, uh, um, a shared environment. So that was back into my uh, 40 gig environment. I had uh, basically a split plane. I have one 40 gig port for the storage path and another 40 gig port for the communication path. Uh, but each one of my uh, commute servers is a uh, storage server as well. Um, I also uh, have been playing around with uh, uh, RDMA, um, iSCSI, uh, and the, uh, there are actually, and, and there actually is starting to be an RDMA Ceph uh, environment. Um, but that uh, kind of reducing compute load uh, in this environment, like, again, because I'm sharing uh, the compute server with storage server, I want to reduce the um, uh, load, compute load of doing a storage operation as much as possible. And, Using something like uh, uh, RDMA, XCSI over uh, RDMA um, is a uh, one way to do that. Volume allocation, I just wanted, so some of the things that I talked about, uh, and then this uh, volume allocation feels like kind of cool. I was testing in the context of a particular um, uh, evaluation that I, uh, proof of concept thing that I want to talk about, I'll talk about uh, in the next few slides. Um, how do you get your volume allocation in a Ceph LVM uh, cluster environment to actually allocate your volume next to where your high VMs are run, particularly if you're running in a distributed environment, which is you know, where I'm going next. Um, Neutron, and again, a lot of our um, tasks are, um, um, are kind of network focused. Uh, so we're uh, looking at uh, how do we best leverage uh, some of the uh, neutron capabilities. Uh, and uh, so I've done a lot of uh, testing of various combinations of uh, uh, standard OBS. Um, there's a couple of NICs that have uh, embedded uh, switches inside them that will take OBS inside the box. Uh, there's various uh, commercial overlays, and again, I've tested pretty much all the uh, commercial overlays that are out there. Um, OpenFlow or not, uh, again, it's another interesting thing. Uh, L2 or OpenFlow or L3 overlays or is another interesting um, issue. Uh, from what I've seen today, it seems like the, uh, the industry uh, and OpenStack and the environment uh, is moving towards a uh, L3 or uh, L2 over L3 uh, topology. Um, that doesn't match really well into um, the, our core network. Uh, and so we're trying to figure out whether that's a, how do we match that uh, environment or, or what do we need to do in our core network to work well with that uh, uh, environment. And the last is um, uh, some of the policy functions that we'd like to have. Um, Again, because of the uh, kind of network overlay uh, or network control we want to have in the environment, uh, we really do want to uh, apply policies to uh, sets of VMs, uh, 
set their applications, uh, make sure that they uh, a path through a uh, environment uh, or a policy to apply whenever you uh, scale, uh, start, stop an application. Uh, and so that this uh, network policies will be an important environment for us. Um, so I was going to just talk about one uh, proof of concept that we did. Uh, and this is something we call uh, distributed data sites uh, and a CDN uh, kind of distribution network uh, as a use case that we were going through. Um, and again, our issue is how do you reduce um, you know, the network traffic here? What we have is content somewhere over on the edge and, and at a, some very location that we get uh, off some uh, There's all the uh, YouTube, Netflix, uh, all those guys are out there on the edge, as well as our internal environment, which we'll have somewhere in here, we have our own um, uh, content that we deliver out of the environment. Uh, how do you reduce this network path so we don't have to have um, terabits of connectivity between all the points uh, in the long haul network? Uh, and put as much of that as we can um, into, you know, close to the user uh, so they can get the, uh, uh, the low latency they would want, uh, as well as reduce the amount of uh, core network uh, that we're using. Um, and our goal, basically, to, we have lots of sites. Uh, we'd like to deploy this environment in uh, these sites as much as possible uh, and distribute this work effectively. And so our goal was basically to have um, many sites uh, and manage them as a single cloud, um, but still have multiple sites out there that we can actually know about, uh, and then uh, control them for one central location that's a highly available environment. Um, some of the operational issues we came up with is uh, high availability of control elements. There's, uh, uh, it's at the point where we're doing this, and this is um, six to nine months uh, old that we actually did this. Um, the HA was pretty lacking, um, and so in the environment we're running, we're an active passive HA for all the control uh, paths. There's still some um, uh, environments that in, in the current now ice house environment actually is uh, you create a pretty reasonable HA environment, but uh, the time was uh, pretty poor. Control elements of the cloud, yes. Um, and that's, that's, again, we're trying to treat this as a single cloud uh, and having lots of different small locations uh, with the central control at SMR. Uh, just some of the, again, some of the issues we were facing. This is, you know, provider networks. We're trying to plug into uh, our existing network environment. Um, we have uh, Verizon as just FIOS, uh, as well as all the wireless um, environments. So we're deploying uh, a bit content out to all these uh, environments. Uh, and so there are lots of different sites, uh, lots of existing networks. How do we plug into that uh, network uh, environment and, and the existing routers that are out there? Um, there was some interesting issues we found in, in allocating large numbers of these uh, networks, particularly when we're actually deploying these small sites out into the network uh, and connecting them to uh, the existing network so to kind of deploy a provider network out to each individual uh, site. And then log collection. Um, because we're, uh, we want to kind of manage the environment uh, while we're running and, and actually look at the operational model, it turns out that the, uh, from the control paths, things like log collection is a big issue uh, and takes up a lot of our bandwidth for the kind of our management path uh, and try to manage that is an uh, interesting issue. Uh, uh, this is an uh, IP chart. Um, they, they're just a bunch of different networks that got created. Uh, for every single uh, site, we would have uh, this kind of environment. Um, our goal was to have um, orchestration here in the central site. Uh, and then there's a storage environment also in the central site. Uh, this is actually where the, a lot of our, our internal content is stored. Uh, and then have kind of these little sites scattered around the 
environment to do different functions. Um, our, we have a, you know, this is a, a reconfigurable ad, optical ad drop multiplexer. This is our core network stuff. Uh, and there's uh, 100 gig uh, generally passed through, and this is moving up to multiple 100 gigs uh, in the future. Uh, but a lot of the connectivity comes through there. And we're basically managing the uh, uh, connection of these networks into a, a wavelength going across one of these fibers. Um, just a little more open environment. So at each um, uh, end site, we were looking to deploy four to eight, 12 um, nodes of equipment. Uh, each one of them would have a, an open flow switch uh, and support a, uh, a scalable, uh, basically the, this caching server uh, would scale up and down based on uh, low as different people came on and made requests of the environment. Uh, the caching server would scale up and down. Um, a shield cache environment was basically just a local uh, cache environment and we could do a predictive um, push of the data that would be expected that would get loaded uh, for that day. Uh, and then the, um, uh, track um, all the updates that were happening in the environment uh, as a um, request got brought into the system um, that would, as a element got brought into the system, it would then trigger the slide. Uh, this is actually I want to talk about this. this is, so this is the control cluster, uh, the origin file server. This is kind of where the original content was stored, uh, and then this tracker would track which nodes had which segments of data. Uh, and the interesting thing in here is that each video, and because we're doing um, uh, adaptive bit rate um, for all these environments, is actually popped up into 18 different versions uh, in this environment. And so. And then chopped up into two to five second chunks, and that's how we would deliver to your end user clients as these uh, little chunks of segments. Um, from that, uh, oh, once you um, have a, a segment in, in the local environment, tracker tracks it. Uh, when a um, a client asks for a uh, a request that comes into the server, uh, authenticates in this environment, authorizes, and Gets built. Uh, one of the issues is um, identifying what the user location is. Uh, and the current environment is kind of mapping an IP address into a location. Uh, and there isn't a clean method, particularly on a mobile phone, that ends up at a, uh, a proxy point uh, inside a network that's actually relative to um, the local environment. Uh, doesn't actually have a good connection to. Locality aspect of that. Um, well, you select one uh, that's relative to relatively close. Uh, select one of the uh, distributed sites as the uh, points that would serve that data, and from that, uh, then that would hit the uh, on caching site. Uh, a log aggregation again. This is the um, one of our big points. It's how we aggregate all these logs together. Uh, this is again. Sorry about. Uh, this is the uh, each peer at the uh, distributed site. Um, we were using OpenFlow uh, switch uh, to uh, create all these networks uh, and manage the connectivity and uh, quality of service uh, of the flow, both back to um, the uh, server, uh, control server, and to every uh, client site that was out there. So what do we, how do we go about this? We deployed um, an emulated environment uh, in our Waltham lab um, and uh, created this uh, test environment where we can uh, have many hundreds of thousands of um, clients um, and do that. Uh, and it's interesting that we can actually, for fiber spools, I'm not sure if people have seen these things, so, uh, 400 kilometers of fiber spools are uh, actually connecting all these things. So we can actually pretend it's a real network in this environment. Um, 
And we leveraged uh, Red Hat because uh, we wanted to actually go through a vendor deployment. Uh, and Red Hat uh, deployed OpenStack, their OpenStack platform. At this point, it was Grizzly based. Uh, we're deploying this. Um, and they kind of found this uh, provider network configuration problem uh, and provided us with a patch and uh, also pushed this upstream. Uh, so this is kind of one of the things Red Hat uh, helped us with. Uh, developed some of the transgender filter rules um, because we wanted to have VMs deployed uh, at these remote sites and we wanted to have the volumes that were allocated to those VMs actually be near that site. Uh, we actually had to use uh, some filtering of where the, uh, uh, the site the volumes were and manage the uh, storage there locally. Um, and glance images, whenever um, we wanted to deploy a new version of the um, uh, hardware. We didn't want to have all that uh, uh, glance images, which actually these things are uh, almost 100 gigabytes of image of uh, these servers and trackers. Uh, Pre-deploying these things uh, without um, uh, was kind of we want to do this off hours. Uh, deploying the glance images out into the uh, remote sites and then uh, uh, running it from there, um, and then. Again, deployed an active passive uh, AJ in our central control site to uh, and this is the OpenStack, AJ uh, OpenStack environment. Uh, part of our environment, so this was our uh, <coughs> process. We actually went through several iterations here. Of, uh, we would track a prediction uh, content that would actually be actually, actually have a production content network. Uh, we could get logs off of that, track what all the requests were, uh, all. Um, what the hot uh, environment was, and uh, create a snapshot of that into our uh, local environment. Uh, we can, again, apply with our test equipment, apply the previous day's requests, uh, and then test how that uh, the system behaved, and then we went through and injected faults into this environment and iterated so that we could test uh, various scenarios <coughs> in the environment uh, and understand what the <coughs> would be of the system and this our model is of, of, is this CDN use case a, a valid use case for this environment? And uh, that's kind of what we're trying to test. Um, some lessons learned. Um, OpenStack, HA needs work. Uh, IceHouse is currently looking better. I have a, uh, an existing OpenStack uh, IceHouse HA environment uh, set up as active, active, and that just seems to be working pretty well. Quantum at the time and new kind of handling of network trunks is still uh, non-existent. Uh, this is a particular problem we have that we want some of the VMs to um, see multiple VLANs or multiple segment IDs, uh, segmentation IDs in uh, all of the stack terms. And we'd like to be able to have specify that multiple segments end up on a single port. Uh, and this isn't in the environment yet. Okay. Um, SRIOV uh, doesn't work very well yet. Um, I have a, working with a couple of hardware NIC vendors. Uh, I'm trying to get that involved. And in the existing environment, uh, the vendors have a, um, uh, a solution that doesn't fit very easily into the existing um, publicly available of this action environment. That I think will change slowly. It, it, it is important, and uh, well, SRIOV and in conjunction with DBK, DBK is an Intel uh, data path on the kit. Uh, so doing um, the whole mode drivers uh, and SRIOV actually has a big improvement, a uh, big impact on our uh, network throughput. Um, Linux and KVM, so that this is certainly still uh, ongoing work. One gig, huge pages just came in. Uh, Linux kernel. Uh, so we're using uh, six point five. Uh, I think seven is coming along, and it has a lot of these things in the environment. Uh, yeah, particularly huge pages and new memory scheduler are kind of in the uh, rel seven, uh, and actually the SSD is a catch-all are all in rel seven. Uh, so rel seven available for things. 
quite a bit. Um, I know part of them. Sorry. Were your storage services, did they have any uh, They did. Uh, and I set this up by hand. So um, in the environments I had, they were all direct attached drives. Uh, and I had a, um, depending on the configuration, to one or two SSDs and four or five hard drives in, in each of the uh, server base. Uh, and then um, and that's actually how we were able to get uh, reasonable uh, streaming. We were able to get 10 gig uh, streaming out of these boxes. Uh, they were not for this environment, because this is really completely a caching environment. Uh, so we, we lost it, we lost it. We could just get it back and get the caching out as long as we detect this died. Um, so A wasn't that good. But we just create exactly. So, and from SSDs, uh, we were actually, because of our, uh, we could segment the SSD environment, uh, our uh, CDN software could say, here's the high end or fast storage, uh, and it would deploy the uh, hot uh, cache environments on that storage. But the, uh, our, one of the things that I'm looking for and, uh, would be to actually use the SSD as a kind of a, uh, automatic cache that so wouldn't have to segment that environment necessarily, uh, knowing what those parts. Those are a trade-off. Yeah. So yeah. So I think uh, there's a couple. Uh, NetApp has something like uh, FlexCache as well. So, so there are a couple of things that are possible there. Um, and then I think the other thing we learned is Verizon. It doesn't. Uh, you know, we don't have a lot of uh, experts in the you know, stack. Uh, environment, we need help in this environment, and so I think one of the things we definitely uh, learn. We need, uh, I can do a lot of this stuff in the lab, but actually deploying this uh, in a field, real field environment, we need something like a, a Red Hat uh, to do, uh, to leverage and find and fix some of the bugs and then push them upstream. And I think that's actually one of the things we're uh, kind of using Red Hat right now is to. Uh, push some of our desires, some of our needs upstream, uh, as well as uh, find and fix bugs and pre-test the environment uh, before we get it. Um, and I think that's oh, that my future work. More AJ, uh, that's kind of uh, our mantra at Horizon, is how do we uh, make this a reliable environment. Uh, hundreds of sites, if you can imagine, uh, all of our cell sites, having a component of this, um, how do we make this work? Um, geographic storage redundancy, uh, that's, we didn't need this in this POC, but that's kind of another one of those areas we need to uh, focus more uh, time on and uh, get a useful function out of that. Uh, network policies again, and mix hypervisor, one of the, um, actually I have, one of these things running in my lab, I have a uh, one OpenStack environment has KVM and uh, VMware ESXi uh, uh, hypervisors uh, in one uh, pool. Uh, and it's actually been very useful. We have uh, a lot of the uh, existing applications we get from vendors. If they've been virtualized, they've often been virtualized on VMware ESX. Um, and so that actually is a reasonable for, particularly my lab environment, for them to uh, develop their uh, and test their environment in, in VMware. In parallel, there's a KVM environment that they can actually do tests on their new environment, and we can compare side to side as to what how the behavior is uh, in the environments. Uh, and it actually seems to work fairly well. Uh, I'm uh, uh, able to bring this up easily um, and uh, manage it uh, as to kind of hypervisors <coughs> without actually knowing this. Uh, um, putting filters on the image type is really the only um, change I had to make. Um, and then, again, to think back on some of the lessons for really our wheeler trials, uh, we're actually uh, going to be deploying uh, uh, some of these uh, environments into a field in the uh, following uh, quarter, and uh, once we get this, we'll have real live uh, uh, traffic. We, uh, you guys probably will be on, probably uh, our employees on uh, this environment, but um, uh, in Q3, our intent to be off the field. And I believe that's it. That's it. Questions? Questions? Yeah, have you run any performance evaluations against those different configurations? Many. What, how did uh, KVM compare to ESI? Uh, 
in the environment we're running on, it was quite a bit slower. And we looked at some of the things that uh, <coughs> KVM was, was slower. Uh, and uh, there was some reason why we actually identified some of the reasons and pushed some of the things up to uh, kind of the old Some of the actually things like huge pages and uh, some of the scheduling aspects were some of the reasons that came up. Um, there's several, there's lots of the projects that are in, in process for making those uh, KVM um, better. Um, the one place where they did change is actually um, where we specifically had a uh, EBDK environment that was tuned for uh, the KVM stack uh, that performed better than the ESX by a large amount. So what drove us to do, to do that? Uh, no, the question is what drove us to look at the various uh, switch in uh, environments and overlays. So we're, we're, some of the things we didn't think were uh, addressed uh, and well covered were uh, performance was not ideal. You know, we're, we're looking for tens of gigabits of throughput for this environment. Uh, at the time, we were looking at it uh, Basic OBS environments working at this. Um, we also were looking for how do we deploy um, or apply network policies uh, to, an, to a, a scale VM uh, or to a, um, uh, 
a newly created VM set. Uh, and service chaining is kind of a particular instance of this thing. Uh, and uh, there was no convenient way to do that in kind of in, in, in native OPS environment. Uh, and that's what's kind of led us down this path. It didn't, the functionality didn't seem to be there, and the performance didn't seem to be there. Uh, so we started looking at alternatives. Uh, and OpenFlow was one alternative to kind of directly manage the environment. Um, there's several uh, embedded switch things which takes OBS out of the kind of compute path uh, environment. Uh, and then there's all the overlays that have a lot of integration with VGP uh, and ISFS and MPLS um, environments that uh, do a lot of that integration for you. Uh, and so that was kind of the motivation. Um, fortunately, can't give you a resolution or a performance or um, results from that um, as to where we'll end up. Uh, yeah, so, so this is part of our Verizon's problem. Uh, so our, our goal is to go into field trial uh, in Q3. Uh, Verizon typically will spend six months in field uh, and then go into production. One of the things we'd like to change from this model is that we accelerate that process to the, you know, instead of six months, a month or a couple of weeks. Um, but that's not going to happen. So I think in, in this environment, we'll, be, we'll probably be in production in the beginning of next year, between 15. Any other questions? Um, oh, actually, and uh, yeah, so I think we'll, we're actually looking at um, both x86 and ARM as from a hardware perspective. Um, and uh, bare metal, uh, Docker, KVM, and ESXi are all hypervisor. Thank you all for coming.